It certainly is copyright because it's written down, <laughs> if any of you were at the previous discussion. Um, our core values are courage and risk-taking, innovation, theatricality, strong narratives, dialogue around social and political change, and egalitarianism. These are just a few of our works that you may recognize, uh, the, big, the big hits, Gross Indecency, The Laramie Project, as well as our 10-year follow-up, The Laramie Project 10 Years Later, which I helped write. Um, I Am My Own Wife, 33 Variations, Tallest Tree in the Forest. It's worth noting, even before I introduce her, that Barb is involved in the original Laramie Project, both as dramaturg and actress, as well as when we staged them both um, at BAM in 2015, somewhere around there. 2013. Um, but we do not have a space, we do not have a season, we are a play development laboratory, really dedicated to, um, to investigating form and content, but within the um, time frame of project-based work. So we may spend upwards of one, two, sometimes even three years developing these plays. So uh, we always say we hope our track record speaks for itself, but we, these come across you know, along every two years. We are constantly in workshop for them in different stages of development, uh, but we do not operate like a traditional theater producing organization. Um, since today's talk is primarily around our book and ergo our method, I'll just give you a few of the, this is my slide, right? Or is it yeah, yours? Yeah, you do this one. You sure? Yeah. We agreed on this ahead of time, but then I get on a roll. Um, moment work uh, is, we found it helpful to define it, and it has a few different definitions. One is a method whereby one might write performance. Um, it, another one is a process of sketching, you know, usually performance in the rehearsal room, but also, uh, a playwright may use it to sketch toward a text document. Um, it's a means to explore a hunch, which we'll get to a little further down the road, without needing to know how or where uh, any particular moment we make might fit into an emerging narrative. I should backtrack and just say, we define moment as a unit of theatrical time, so we may make something as small as uh, a few minutes, or we may make a moment that lasts much longer, but each unit, we actually think of them as the equivalent of a word if you're thinking about the metaphor of writing a novel. So these theatrical units of time are like words which we then make sentences, which we then string together eventually to make a play. And lastly, I like to think of it also just as a means to analyze performance from a structuralist perspective, <coughs> which we will also get to in a bit. But um, if I am the keeper of the keys in terms of uh, our history, Barb is certainly is the writer of the tabla rasa, or the, the um, new, as of April of 2018, um, the masterwork here that we will call it is truly her collaboration with Moises and then the company members, myself included at the bottom, who um, helped chime in every once in a while, but was a gargantuan task to assimilate 25 years of knowledge and uh, even to the different places all of us company members have taken the work and really coalesce it and assimilate it into one work. So she's gonna speak a little bit about what's in the book. And I without further ado, I would like to introduce Barbara Pitts McAdams. Um, so around 2002, when Moises was being asked to teach this, he said, why don't you start coming with me and see if there's a method here, because he was doing it very sort of intuitively, and by then we all were doing it very intuitively as well. So I would follow him to a workshop and really just transcribe, transcribe, and then try to pull out what felt repeatable and what felt like a method. And then um, we had an internal document that I wrote that was sort of the manual that we could teach from. But when it came to putting a book together, what's the next slide here? Okay. Um, we had to then decide, I mean, people kept asking when they would do a workshop, where can I read more about this? And we would find ourselves sending people to, uh, you know, Rich Brown's 17 page article, which I mentioned his name because it's a, a great Atha article on where we were when he was writing his MFA. But eventually we were like, we better write our book before somebody else does. So um, uh, we decided to tell the story of the company as well as provide a blueprint of the method. And um, so how that kind of ended up playing out is the first section, if you read, is uh, part one, is really Moises's, it's in his voice, and it's really who he was when he founded the company with Jeff Lahost, 
and who they brought on board and what the early work was like and what was happening in New York at the time, what were all the influences. And I find it very inspiring and, and fun to think about you know, those early days of theater making in New York. So he does a, a really nice job of kind of setting the stage and I think kind of um, one of the things we think of moment work doing is really waking up the theatrical imagination. So uh, he does that in part one and then I got to write all the very difficult nuts and bolts of how do you actually do moment work in the room. And I say I, but you know I would draft it and then he would weigh in and we would redraft and redraft. And that process took about three years to finally kind of figure out how to articulate it on the page because it is very experiential. And then um, moment work has three levels to it. The third being, um, we'll break that down in a minute, but um, the actual playmaking process. And because every play is different, we basically used that as an opportunity if you want to know more about how gross and decency came together or what were the challenges of making the Laramie Project or um, Andy Paris and Anushka um, Paris Carter's uh, uh, Uncommon Sense. Uh, you can read a narrative of how those pieces came together. And then there's a part three of the book that are um, rehearsal considerations and things that moment work can help you solve. It, and then the, uh, the contributors um, each wrote an essay uh, sort of addressing things like how do you conduct interviews or um, how do you enfranchise, uh, what's, your, what's yours? A, a Team of dramaturgs is the title, but how do you, how do you think of everyone in a room as, as a dramaturg or contributor, or holder of the story? Yeah, and how do you know what um, elements of the stage you want to bring into the room? Um, so that's the, the end of the book are some essays. So that's, that's basically what's in the book, but... As um, my college students often say, what even is moment work? What even is it? <laughs> so um, when, when we get into a room to work on something, we have a hunch. Uh, as Peter Brooks says, he goes into the rehearsal process with a, a, a nameless hunch, and then he needs to test it. So for us, that hunch might come about in different ways. Uh, maybe it's something that, that you want to see on stage that you're not seeing on stage. Um, you know, a particular story or point of view, or something you want to understand more deeply. I think certainly when Matthew Shepard was killed, it, you know, going there uh, was just a pull to try to understand how did this happen in this community and to understand it more deeply. Um, or what's a story you need to tell? It just keeps nagging at you back there that you need to tell it. Or something that you fear, you know, that you want to kind of confront in the room. So your hunch can come from a lot of different places. Um, did you want to take over? Sure. Uh, so once we have our hunch and we get into the room and, um, you know, this is a little bit more about how we would teach the method because um, as company members we might have already become pretty facile in this next step, but it's always good to remind ourselves that every element of the stage, and we define that as anything that communicates from the stage, um, so that may be text, that may be lights, that may be props, that may be gesture, that may be, you know, all, all of the viewpoints are elements, at, among others, that everything that communicates from the stage is worthy of exploring um, on an elemental level. So we call them the elements of the stage. And um, so I even say, we even say they can be conceptual. So they can be props or costumes, but they can be the element of surprise, an element of style, of suspense, even of, of withholding or uh, the lack of light, you know, darkness or um, obfuscating something. So we spend lots of time in a room with students and also while we're working, um, seeing how all of those elements may open up doors or unlock ways to communicate certain ideas theatrically. So the point of exploring the elements of the stage is to come just going to say, previous slide, is to communicate narr uh, theatrical narratives. So we oftentimes think of a playwright getting into a room, sitting down and writing a play, as this traditional model of coming up with a narrative that we then get into a room and stage. And I just have to say, even after the last couple hours talking, um, for those of you who, who were here previously, um, you know, one of Moises's real urges to start thinking about this particular method was an anecdote he often tells us, and I find it useful, which is, as a young grad student, 
directing student, he was actually told that a director's job is to make a world in which the text is believable. And that was, uh, and for his mind, even immediately he said, that doesn't feel right. He said, well, that's like telling a, an architect the point of your job is to make a building that doesn't fall down. Um, he was like, there's so much more to communicate. There's so much more about being a director for him. And he said, I want to find you know, the message in the medium in a way. I want to, I want to create the forms that communicate along with the text. So just to say, like, um, based on our previous discussion, that our, our work is all about how to tell story and communicate narrative in ways that are other than text. So I think it's a good charge, even based on our previous discussion, is how do you then um, set those, right? How do, you, how do you own those and how do you, um, how are you able to recreate those? So those are, those are the things that, that um, we are often, are always still wrestle with. But um, here's a list, thank you, for uh, how we might begin with students even generating what do you think can communicate from the stage? So this is a list I made with a particular group of students from Drew University with Barb and they came up with all of these. Each list is different for every group, for every ensemble. We often say, you know, if you're working with Cirque du Soleil, their list of things that they want to communicate with may be all based around the body or about um, Yeah, I don't virtuosity. see fire up there or trapeze. trapeze. Yeah. Um, but I do see Meryl Streep. I don't know how she <laughs> ended up on the list. Meryl doesn't communicate from the stage. I don't know who does. Yeah, so for us, like, we're not super fussy about what's on this list. If somebody says, well, is the audience an element of the stage? We say, well, let's put it up there and then put a question mark. So the list is just your reminder that as you're creating your narrative, to go back and look at the other tools you have in your toolkit, um, because so often we end up just editing text and editing text, and sometimes you could solve it by letting one of the other elements carry some of the, the narrative weight of a, of a particular moment. Want me to keep going? Okay, so we alluded to this earlier, that when we, when we teach it and the way it's broken down in the book, is that level one is really learning how to get your hands on these elements. So that was a huge list you just saw, but when we teach, we tend to start with the same things. The actual space we're in, um, gesture, props, we get some clip lights in the room, and that's when things really start to come alive, when people can really start lighting. Uh, I know as an undergraduate, even taking a lighting class, I don't think they ever let us hold a lighting instrument. So um, really enfranchising everyone to let go of their labels of I'm an actor, I'm a director, I'm this costume designer, and letting everyone in the room be a moment maker and bring their skill set um, uh, to it. Like here you see a picture of Moises in the center there, the top picture of the two. And um, he's probably directing a moment there, but he could just as easily be manipulating something in that, in that uh, picture. So the first level is really like learning a vocabulary for talking about theater. Like one of the definitions of moment work is uh, a process in which to analyze and critique theater. So when you're seeing something, you know, what is it that the lights are doing that are making this moment impactful? What, what, you know, why did they choose to use neon lights on stage? And really thinking about how all those elements are reading. Are they warm? Are they hitting you in your gut? Are they just beautiful? Um, and really looking for all the opportunities for how the elements can read. And we usually teach that without imposing any kind of a hunch because I'm a very literal person and I immediately just start trying to illustrate if I have a hunch in my head, I'm gonna make moments to that hunch, rather than just tease out, you know, you know what, what does this scarf do in the light? Is it, you know, does it float? Can you change the shape of it? And really just exploring those things for their own value. And then level two, and I, I wanna just check the time. We have like five more minutes? Okay. Um, is really, yeah, you wanna take that? Sure, yeah, and once we start, and, and I should also say we, often hold text until some of the last um, moments that we, or elements that we explore simply because we know that because we are so habituated to starting with text that text will often I say get in the driver's seat and take the narrative um, where it wants to go no matter how many other storytelling uh, vocabularies or forms you found so um, after we get to text incorporating it sort of on an equal playing field as these other elements of the stage, you generally find that you have a moment that is communicating something. So if it's 
if you collect a bunch of moments, say 10, 12, through uh, experimentation in a room, and they all sort of dance around a hunch, then we might start level two, which is making short form narratives based on either sequencing the elements that we've made thus far, or beginning to layer, um, like literally putting two moments on stage simultaneously to see if the forms or the content begin to speak to one another and create discourse. Um, and then also then when the audience's imagination meets that discourse. So there's a lot of tinkering. We often say it feels like we're in a little bit of a lab. We'll move a sequence around. We'll change the length or duration of a layer and begin to make these longer sentences and see how those speak. Now if I could just jump in, one thing that we didn't say right off the bat is that when you make a moment, you frame it in these brackets. And the brackets are the words, I begin, your moment happens, I end. Or if you're making a group moment, we begin, your moment happens, we end. And then when we move to sequences, we say, we begin, and you thread two, three, four moments together, maybe you're starting to um, overlap them. So you might be sequencing them, you might be layering them, you might be pulling bits out and putting them in a later moment. Um, and so that sequence will become, we begin, we end. And just the act of putting it in the brackets I mean, I find for myself, it really helps me when I'm overwhelmed on a project to think, I don't know where this moment goes, but I know I'm gonna begin and I'm going to um, explore one gesture for a character and I'm just gonna show some text with this gesture and we'll just put it on the board and we'll title it and we'll go, ah, okay, there's, there's something in that. I don't, I don't know where that fits yet. Mm. And then, you know, then comes the mystery of how do you make longer form narrative. And I think what the book does well is it walks you through level one very succinctly in a way that you can almost drop into any group and have a, a valuable similar experience. Level two will be based around whatever hunch you gather. So it deviates a little bit and creates, we, we deal with it in the book in terms of um, examples and case studies. But then really level three is how do you make this into a full production over the course of possibly many years. And so the book then just looks at our experience doing that. Um, and so it doesn't bear too much to say in this book talk um, much about level three other than anecdotally through the book. Um, and as Barb said, I think we covered everything in the book. It, it gives an, the antecedents to the method. It gives um, some philosophical and, and, method and, and um, theoretical underpinnings. It walks you through the manual. It gives you the case studies and the history of our company, as well as these essays that we've all written. It's sort of a, I call it a um, Swiss Army knife of a book. It really has a lot in it. <laughs> Little something for everyone. So if you're just a big Laramie project junkie, you can find your place in this book. And we we have heard that um, people are using it in their classrooms. That th it's always your fear is that what's on the page won't work when you try to get up on your feet. And we're getting some good feedback that it does in fact work. We only have six copies out at the front desk, but it's uh, retailed at $18 and we're gonna sell f six copies today for 15. So if you don't have a copy and you want one, they're out at the front desk. Pretty color photos as well. <laughs> of all of well so here's a little here. bit of what we were, Oops. Oh, that's all right. No, I just, we had a, um, we teach the method and currently are building our, um, so we're presence in MFA programs as well as undergraduate universities and colleges. Um, but we also hold our own workshops throughout the year and um, have expanded now into doing some on interview techniques, some on the moment work just specifically. And then there's some people in the room who took um, one of our company members, Amanda Gronick, was a genius structural um, mind. And so she taught a recent class about making theater out of interviews, but really from a, a how to structure them together sort of way. So. Keep, you know, check our website if you're interested in, in learning more about that. Um, pick up our book if you want. And the last slide there. That was it. That's it. Oops. Okay, whoops, right. that's not pretty. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, thank you so much. We're gonna just take a minute to get set up for our next book talk, and then uh, following that, we'll have a few minutes for questions, and then we'll move into our uh, practical roundtable. And once again, thank you so much to the comments of Martin. Yeah. Yeah.
Great. All right. I'm going to get started so that we have some time to talk collectively. Um, my name is Koya Paz, um, and um, thank you so much for bringing me here. Um, it's so um, lovely to be in a room with so many people who care about device theater, ensemble made theater. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this book that I worked on with my collaborator, Chloe Johnston, about ensemble made theater in Chicago. Um, Great, and I'm gonna start by reading just the first uh, paragraph of the book to give it some context. Um, Those of us who make performance are in the business of making worlds. In traditional theater, that's often done from the top down with a small group of decision makers, writers, directors, enlisting other artists, performers, designers to realize their vision. But Chicago has a long tradition of theater that reimagines that relationship performance processes that center on collective creation, authored not by one, but by many, by everyone in the room. It is a city that imagines itself to be a little rough and tumble, a city built by immigrants and working class people, a city that rebuilds itself again and again, a city that will, quote, get it done. (coughs) Chicago doesn't have a Broadway or a Hollywood. It has neighborhoods, the boundaries and meanings of which are fiercely defended by the people who live in them. And it has storefronts and parks and church basements, all of which become homes for ways of making performance that are flexible and resourceful, driven not by dreams of a name in lights, but by a radical commitment to one another, to the relationships and artistic risks that are made possible when there are no writers, no actors, no directors, just a room full of creators. That paragraph seems uh, complicated in light of our previous presentation about copyrighted law. Um, so um, there is um, one of the things that we do in this book. Um, It's both a handbook and a history. It documents the practices of 15 companies who use a co-creative ensemble or devised practice to make their work. I want to just say quite honestly, devised is not a word we use in the book, maybe more than once. Um, Our editors made us put it in the title so that people would know what we were talking about. Um, We much prefer co-created or ensemble made as ways of thinking about the the work. Um, And part of what we were trying to do in this book um, was to archive a largely non-scripted practice. Um, Chloe and I strangely went to the same graduate program. We're both graduates of the PhD in performance studies at Northwestern, though we were not there at the same time and we didn't meet doing that. Um, Chloe is a neo-futurist, so she had been working in ensemble created work for a very long time, as had I. I was the co-founder of Teatro Luna, an all-Latina theater company, and now I'm the artistic director at Free Street Theater. We never met. The nature of Chicago is that it is so segregated that if you are working in a mostly white theater company on the north side, you may well never meet somebody who's working in an all-Latina theater company on the west side of the city. Um, The theatrical ecology doesn't run that way. But we had the kind of great... um, fortune of both being asked to give a workshop at a symposium on performance and practice. And there frankly weren't enough people at the workshop to break into two different sessions on devised theater. Like, well, you can do a lot. Um, devised theater is improvisational sometimes in the way we make it, uh, but you do need people. Um, And there weren't enough people. So we very quickly, within five minutes, kind of combined to make one workshop. And we were so excited about that and so curious about um, 
sort of how we didn't really know about each other's work. Um, so often, uh, ensemble-made practice doesn't start with the script and it doesn't always end with the script. Maybe it ends with an outline for whoever's running the board, <laughs> you know, like yeah, bring up the lights now. Um, so we wanted to find a way of archiving it. Um, we wanted to encourage cross-pollination. So often we train in the methodology of our company and that's it. Um, we wanted to trace relationships and threads across companies. Actually, we were really surprised by how similar our practices were, that they had very different politics, and we were curious about why that was. And as we were writing the book, um, we found that a lot of people had learned from the same people. Ay, ¿qué pasó? Does this a word from our sponsors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's happening? There it is. Um, so we wanted to trace relationships and threads across companies, and we wanted to create something useful to practitioners and educators. Um, we wanted a book that we could teach in the classroom, something that gave some context on companies working, but also really was offering people exercises on how to recreate work themselves. Um, though Chloe always says that her dream audience for the book is like a high school teacher who doesn't care about theater at all and is just trying to make history class more interesting. <laughs> I say my dream reader of the book is someone who likes to get drunk and play theater games at parties. So, um, One of the things that we do in the book um, is trace a particularly Chicago thread of um, ensemble creation back to Hull House, to Viola Spolin and Neva Boyd, who were making work with, um, you know, sort of documenting songs and games from immigrant populations coming to Hull House. Viola Spolin, how many of you are familiar with Viola Spolin? Yeah, about half. So um, she um, was the mother of Paul Sills, who went on to found the Compass Players and Second City. And I don't mean to do this sort of um, ascribe her only importance to being the mother of him, but he is sort of better known um, as a practitioner. But she was writing down this idea that you could play with people and that that would be generative as a way of making theater and performance. And she was in the 1920s making performance that brought together people who didn't even speak English um, to make, you know, they didn't speak the same languages as each other. Um, to make work about Chicago. And we were so interested in using that as a kind of originating thread. I want to say that the artistic director of Teatro Luna um, also thinks it's really important to put the asterisks on that, that they were collecting those games and those practices um, <laughs> from immigrant peoples at Hull House, so that we, we don't want to mark them as the originators, um, but Viola Spolin was the one who wrote them down per conversation earlier. She has the copyright. So we were also interested in where um, these two show up. Um, side note, in my research about Viola Spolin, I found out that as a young woman, until she became a professional actress, uh, she dressed exclusively in men's clothing. So um, I'm so obsessed with that, and I want someone to write a book about her. It's probably not me, but I was like, oh, it's my gay fairy godmother. Okay. I'm going to quickly run through the books in the company, so you can see they're quite different. Um, 500 Clown is a clown theater company. They do plays like 500 Clown, Frankenstein, Macbeth. This is from Frankenstein. Um, really physical, very little text and talking, um, all white. <laughs> Why am I a hater? I just have to mark <laughs> that happens. Um, About Face Youth Theater. Um, About Face itself is an LGBTQ and theater that does mostly scripted work, but their youth theater has always been for about 20 years um, ensemble devised. Um, they do really extraordinary work. Um, Albany Park Theater Project, also a youth-based theater, um, but this is a show that they performed at the Goodman. So you can see that they place a high value on the aesthetics and design of their work, which is not something we often associate with youth-made devised work. Um, Barrel of Monkeys is a group of adult actors and writers who adapt to the writing of grade school students for the stage. So um, it's quite funny to take the work of a third grader and then have adults interpret it. Um, it's own thing. Every house has a door. Um, 
these artists, uh, formerly known as Goat Island, are now operating under um, the title Every House is a Door. Their work is um, pretty esoteric, um, highly intellectual. Um, yeah, I won't say more about that. Fee Melanin is a collective of uh, young women of color. By young, I mean they're in their 20s, um, who uh, make plays about kind of being feminists of color. I don't know why I said kind of, that is what they do. Um, Free Street Theater is the oldest company in the book. I'm the artistic director now, but it was founded in 1969 in response to the 1968 riots in Chicago. We had back-to-back -back riots. Um, and the city decided that the way to solve the racial and economic tension in the city was to start a free street theater. So Free Street Theater was actually started by the mayor and the then what became the Illinois Arts Council. Uh, I want to say that uh, it has become increasingly radical since that moment um, and now um, performs mostly site-specific work designed to address gaps in representation. Um, Honeypot Performance is an Af Afrofuturist feminist collective um, that makes work that um, draws on house music as its primary aesthetic influence. Looking Glass Theater, we debated a lot about whether to include them uh, in a book about co-created or ensemble or devised work. Um, they assign a primary playwright to their work, um, but use a co-creative process to do that. Um, they're maybe best known for being Mary Zimmerman's theater company. Um, so they are tricky. Um, their earlier work, I would say, is more in the spirit of ensemble made work than their current. I'm not sure they would agree. The neo-futurists, um, best known for Too Much Light Makes the Baby Go Blind, which is now called The Infinite Wrench. Um, they do 30 plays in 60 minutes. Yeah, that's right. I was like, not 60 plays in 30 minutes. Um, the Second City. We also argued about this, but in the spirit of tracing things back to Hull House, we thought, well, Paul Sills very openly ascribes um, his work in improv as um, to his mother and to thinking about the radical democracy that can happen when you bring people together in a room to make work with each other. Um, so they ascribe this deep social justice ethos to their work. Also, our editor thought it would help us sell books. <laughs> I'm trying to be really transparent about some of the stuff that happens in these conversations. Um, Southside Ignoramus Quartet might be my favorite company in the book. Um, I put two pictures here because I think they're uh, all Mexican-Americans from the south side of Chicago um, doing uh, what they call purposefully raw and real work. Um, but they perform in a tent in the founder's backyard. Um, there were no theater spaces owned by Mexicans or in Mexican communities on the south side of the city. Um, so they decided that they would quite literally build one. It has a beer window, um, air conditioning in the summer, um, and it seats about 40 people. Um, I think their work is interesting for space, not just process. Teatro Luna, All Latina. Theater company, they've actually moved to LA, so whether they count as <laughs> Chicago theater, I don't know, but they were in Chicago for about 16 years. Um, Walkabout Theater, um, they do um, mostly physical work. I think not unlike what you were describing with Tectonic, add the text last. Um, actually, their process sounds very similar to what you were describing. One of the things that's been really interesting is seeing, even though what the companies make turns out to be really different in terms of its aesthetic, so many people are using similar techniques. There's not a one of the companies in the book that doesn't have some kind of process of sticking everything on the wall. You know, many of these companies have turned over their whole rehearsal space to a writable surface. Others are kind of carrying around piles of giant post-its, little post-its, you know, like everybody has that. Everybody is thinking about how do we check in with each other as a first step, then how do we build our comfort as an ensemble? How do we make lots of small things? I don't think anybody's like, we're gonna make a whole play right now. We have to break the play into the smallest unit and how different companies <laughs> define that has been really interesting. And then the final company in the book um, are the Young Fugitives. They're um, all uh, kind of uh, masculine, uh, what's the right way to, 
they are all probably people who would be read as um, men of color, um, regardless of whether that is their kind of personal identification. It's sort of complicated. Um, they do very highly physical um, work. They're trying to engage with questions of violence um, in the city. This is a piece about, uh, this is from a play called Track 13 about Deontay Mackey, who was shot by an off-duty police officer. Um, and killed in Chicago. Um, and so they did this kind of mime performance about it. It's really quite extraordinary. Um, so this is all very, very different work. Um, some of what we were trying to do in talking about this, one is to sort of assert that um, there's a reason why you see so much of this happening in Chicago. Some of it is affordability. I mean, I'm talking to people in New York, you know it is expensive here. It's actually not that expensive to make work in Chicago relative to most urban cities. We are the second largest, um, second, third largest city in the country. It depends what, how you're counting. Um, so you see a lot of people can, take, can spend three years to make a play without having to sell the play. Um, there's a strong kind of social justice. Um, we don't like what you're telling us to do, so we'll make it our, our own way ethos. Um, but also, like, some of what we were really curious about is how do we encourage people to use each other's work for their own purposes, which is sometimes complicated. But I think, like, even if I read Tectonic's book, I probably couldn't do it yet as well as you can do it. So I think that, I hope that is not like undermining the purpose of the book, you know, but like the reality is that we don't lose anything by sharing our practice with each other, not just the product, right? There's only to be gained from doing that. And so we were really trying to create a context in which we were hearing about each other's work and able to kind of pick up the book and execute and exercise. Um, also, the way that our company's philosophy informs so much of what we do. So for example, three of the companies in the book, we don't need it anymore, three of the companies in the book offered a pushing game. And like, what's so funny to me about it is in Teatro Luna, which is an all femme company, their pushing game is like, I want to tell you what I see in you. It's so beautiful. We're going to gently push against each other while we describe each other to each other. <laughs> the young fugitives who are talking about, you know, violence and they're, you know, like expected, you know, they're trying to deal with their, their own anger. You know, they're like actually like sumo wrestling, trying to push each other as hard as they can, you know, out of a circle. And then walkabouts pushing game is all about balance, you know, because they're going to need to be able to like have five people up on shoulders. So they're like practicing not losing their balance. <laughs> so I mean, okay, on, these sound like the exact same exercise, but the context of the company makes them so different from each other. So we were really curious about the places where people were doing it. You know, we had artists arguing about who had invented an exercise, you know, like an I come from exercise. I'm like, I have heard like 15 different companies say that they invented this exercise. Um, the reality is Viola Spolin probably <laughs> invented that exercise and nobody's giving her any credit. So we asked everybody that offered us an exercise, who, where did you learn this and how did you adapt it? Because it's in the adaptation that the work is happening. And I'll leave it there. So um, I'll start first just by asking, um, did you all know each other? Or, or did you two know Goya and vice versa before? No. Um, would you mind sharing a few thoughts that emerged in hearing about each other's work? I can go first. Um, obviously, maybe it's not obvious, but I feel like um, tectonic looms large in thinking about how you create work as an ensemble, how you create work based on interviews. Um, I don't know that anybody has studied theater and not 
thought about the Laramie Project at some point, if you've formally studied theater. So, um, but what I appreciate about the book, which I pre-ordered, so I, I got it as soon as it came out, is that um, the translation from an exercise into a play is a really hard leap, you know? So thinking about like how generous it is to offer a path that far is really a, a usable gift. Yeah, I, I got so excited. I was like, I wonder if I could just take a whole year and go to Chicago and, you know, just dip my toe in all these places. I just think that must have been incredible. And those pictures alone were just... I, I, I think you're probably um, giving visibility to a lot of companies that, you know, that I didn't know about. I knew a few of them. Um, just very exciting to want to, like, go find them and seek them out and support their work. I think what you started with was really great context because I was, I had to, I went through a few different experiences hearing that piece of text. One was because I spent a little time in Chicago. I know that all to be true. And then part of me was like, New York's just as good. Like having this weird competition thing in my head with comparing New York and Chicago. And I think, um, I think that what you set up at least, and I'm so curious to read the rest, is just a real deep dive into how the culture influences the work, tracing it back, owning its history, like really taking that time and spreading out and, go and going deep. And I, I think that is, and I just have to eat it and say like, we don't have that much of a feeling of that here. There's not the community and history as much as Chicago. And so um, as much as we do honor our, our predecessors and, and attribute our, all of our techniques to where Moises and we got them. Um, I'm really excited in, in hearing you um, talk about that in the book because it seems like that means a lot to you and it, and it now means a lot to me too. So. And we'll get into this with the round table, but I, I made me laugh that you said my editor made me put devised in the title mm -hmm. um, because I, I remember I was... Um, assistant directing a high school production that became the first UK production of the Laramie Project back in 2004. And the British people were all like, oh, so it's a devised piece. And I was like, okay. Like that wasn't even language we were using when we made the Laramie Project or we were using moment work to build a play. And then eventually we just sort of accepted that that's what we were making. So it'll be interesting to drill down into that in a little bit. Yeah, that's a lot of what today is about, that sort of slow acceptance. Um, but, but really, I was excited to discover both of your books being published in this year, um, because uh, as much as so much of how the word device has been embraced in the US comes from funding and from arts institutions, really the great stakeholders of it all are the artists and the education uh, the, and the universities. And so to have uh, all three of you who represent both ends of, of that conversation and to have your book speak so directly to that full conversation was really wonderful. Thank you to you and Frank and the Graduate Center for hosting us and, and creating this. Thank you. Um, did anyone have any questions that uh, you wanted to ask to either uh, or any of the panelists? Uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit before, but um, that transition where you find terminal velocity from an exercise into a piece. Um, and we sort of were talking about it legally um, but I, I was curious, I suppose that's maybe what you were writing the book for, was to try to help people get from exercise to peace. And I, I, I'm wondering if you, if you feel, <laughs> how successful you feel the book is of that, but also just for you as creators, where do you find that terminal philosophy? Um, and um, if you would just expand upon that. Let me ask you a question. In terminal velocity, would an example be like that blob that we were talking about earlier? Oh, sure. I mean, is, is that what you mean by terminal well, velocity? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I suppose, maybe from my experience, it's like what brings people together is one thing. And then when does, does that transition into a specific piece? 
or um, like what I suppose maybe devised theater for me is what keeps people together when there's no story. And then I suppose terminal velocity is when does that transition into story, maybe? It's probably worth saying that, I don't know if we would make the definition of your ensemble made because we usually come into a room with one or two, like Jimmy and I are co-creating a piece right now and we haven't decided, are you the director? Are we both playwrights? It's, we don't need to know that yet. Um, but ultimately, even if we bring in an ensemble of people, we are gonna make final artistic choices and that's how I think we get terminal velocity, is that we accept, and it is difficult often with students, because you enfranchise, you enfranchise, and then in the way we make work, whoever's hunch it was is ultimately going to get to make the final uh, creative decisions. Well, there's a lot of pushback. Like We're, we're not um, shy about arguing with each other, and there will be tears and, and all that. Um, but so our... In general, we, huh? Film the act three of Laramie's story. Sometimes you have to kick out the person who's in charge. Yes. Just say, like, take a step out of the room for a sec. We're going to make something and show it to you. And, you know, then they might see it and be like, oh, my God, you're right. I mean, there, there may be a lot of discourse. A lot of we'll friction. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and I want to say that um, many of the companies in the book, uh, what we talk about kind of the place for leadership and a director, because I don't think there's a single company, like, if you're really being honest about practice, um, you need somebody who is stepping into the role of the audience to sort of see, you know, ultimately, mm. you know, there's, it's something beautiful to make work together, but we make work for an audience. And so we have an obligation to their experience also. And you can't see that from the inside. And it, sometimes that rotates. It might be like, okay, you guys are going to do it, and I'm going to watch, and now we're going to do it, and you're going to watch. But that we ha defining sort of leadership and, and who has the authority to make a cut or a change if something's just not working, you know, like, it's so violent to say, like, kill your darlings, but there has to be somebody who is imbued with that authority, so, but I, yeah, I think for each group that makes work, that looks different, sure. and it may look different project to project. I think one of the things that um, we try to remind ourselves is that the play often is going to tell you, like, if we agree on the hunch, and we trust the process, Oftentimes, those decisions are made based on really dr clear dramaturgical expressions back from the material. So it won't often result in a taste issue or a, you know, I just feel like it should be this. You can point at it and say, well, what beat is this? Like, is it, is it necessary according to the dramaturgical rules we've set up? Is it communicating the strongest? And um, that's why we always resort back to structure because it's hard to, to disagree with structure, we can all see it. So, um, but, but also just to touch on your part of your question, which I think was about pro, um, um, playing and making, which is, I, I often think, you know, I'm, Anne Bogart trained me and, and I spent a lot of time with her viewpoints and that is a training method as well as, um, you know, some codified steps in order to generate in composition. But it's also just good to be trained and be facile and, and remind yourself like going to a gym and so we will do that as a company you know make sure that we um, make non-text moments that um, or or just remind ourselves of the elements and just make really basic things just to keep flexing those muscles even if we have no expectation of it appearing in a piece and I think that that um, you know keeps us all on our toes and I, so I, I think that both are inner interplay um, in any rehearsal room, but the, the playing and then the aha that may be a usable form or aha that actually hits a beat in our, in our piece and so therefore we absorb it into uh, our process or our, our, our proposed product. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi, uh, thanks for coming. I, um, I'm in the middle of reading moment work now, and I was just wondering if there was any, um, if you could speak to either sequencing moments together or layering them, and if there is any like intuitive guide as to how many to do at once, or could you do, is it, it I'm sure it's perfectly possible to do both and figure it out. 
the moment work uh, escalates, you know, so in, in many ways, writing the book was a challenge because our method is really lather, rinse, repeat. Make a moment, you know, get feedback on that moment, make another moment, uh, make a whole bunch of prop moments, make a whole bunch of like, oh, we have to deal with the element of representation. Who can play who in this story? Make a bunch of moments. Um, and so sometimes the layering and sequencing kind of happens organically. You like the way the chairs are set up in this moment, but the text is wrong, or you want to pass a prop along. So you end up taking bits from, from different forms. Um, and I think often uh, we, we call it scoring a moment, you know, or you can score a sequence where often the first time a group is making a moment, um, the lights will come on, the sound will go, people are talking and moving. And so you have to take a step back and say, okay, let's score each one of these elements and look at its narrative line and figure out, like, does the sound need to start when the moment starts? Does everyone need to be moving the minute, the second the moment starts? And really, like, let each element have its, uh, let it land for people. Um, and that's true of sequencing and layering, too. And I'm the queen of making, dumping everything into a moment and hoping something is interesting. So, so that can take some, you know, careful teasing out from whether it's your moment work teacher or just you as an observer saying, what happens if we remove um, the sound? Or sometimes you need to just pull everything out and say, can I just hear that text? You know, so sometimes if you try to layer too much, you'll know, you know, and then, and then you can really ask yourself, I like the metaphor Moises will say, it's like when you go to a salad bar and you get all these delicious things and you put them in the salad and then somehow you have a bad salad, <laughs> right? Like you can't really have tomatoes and, and beets together. Like you have to choose one, you know? So that's, I think you sort of just have to feel it and know, and different people have a different aesthetic. They want to be overwhelmed and some people want something very spare. And I think that definitely applies to individual elements in a moment. And then there's the question of layering and sequencing moments, which I, I think might also be of value. And, and some of that is so dependent on the material because it gets into writing, essentially, narrative techniques. So are you following a character that it feels like the next beat you want to make is in pursuance of a character's arc? Or is it to elaborate on a thematic thread that you're finding or just cut it off and explore the opposite, just to explore the element of juxtaposition. So lots of different things will inform on what to maybe juxtapose, layer and structure, uh, and sequence rather. So it's funny though, just on that topic, because you could pick up our book and, and, and see different examples, and, and maybe that will help you most, just learning by, by um, anecdote. But I will say, no matter how much we write performance, those principles of playwriting still find their way in, you know, like how much do you want to build tension by intro introducing a ball in the air, right, and the audience wants to watch it drop or invest in a, a point of tension, and that tension doesn't have to exist in character, plot, or words, but rather it can exist on a discursive theatrical plane. So it's, it's just moving kind of good playwriting techniques into really theatrical vocabularies oftentimes. I have a question. Um, what what are you all working on creatively right now? What's your next big project? Oh, so at Free Street, we turn 50, 5 zero, in June. So we're working on a project called Still Here, which is a manifesto for survival in Chicago. We're talking to hundreds of people. Um, our goal is to source material for that project in all 50 wards of the city. Um, and then we're gonna perform in all 50 words of the city in one day. Um, that's our stunt, and then we'll do the show. But we're really interested in sort of like, how do we imagine a city that makes room for all of us? Um, Chicago is, I'm, I'm sure New York faces these problems, but Chicago notoriously um, is credited with inventing modern segregation, um, inventing practices like redlining. Um, the systemic problems of the city are so, they're built into the way our city was built. And so 
so much of what we try to do at Free Street is think about the ways in which theater and performance might be an ally to larger social justice movements and to justice in and for our city. And so we sort of talk about this 50th celebration as a performance meets a protest. Like we demand a city that makes room for all of us. Barb, you, you teased your project. I did, I did tease it a little bit. Um, hers is called Still Here, ours is called Here Too. Um, stories of uh, gun violence, stories of youth activism that they happen here too. So we're, we're sort of using this extraordinary year of the, the Parkland shooting and everything that has happened in this year up to the anniversary and we've been interviewing young activists around the country and finding out how, you know, that it's not just the March for Our Lives students who are active and really just kind of, it felt like a lightning rod moment that I haven't experienced since um, the death of Matthew Shepard, you know, even with all the other movements that have been so powerful in the last few years, like they galvanized, I think, the country in a way that is extraordinary and, and finding out like how, what was, what was happening that created this culture um, how intersectional can we make this? Um, and partnering with lots of different communities to make their own version of a play. So, you know, if Tectonic is interested in form and content, um, often our work has this sort of social justice kind of theme because these are the kinds of stories we're excited about. Um, but what is the next form of an interview-based play? In, you know, are we gonna repeat the forms of the Laramie Project from the year 2000? <laughs> or are there new forms? So that's one of the things that we wanna ask formally as we're working on this thing that really stirs us and touches us as we talk to young people around the country about how they're dealing with this gun violence epidemic. Um, if anybody knows young activists and you wanna send them our way, that's uh, appreciated. Do you want anything to that? Well, we literally just came out of a week in the woods where Barb and I, were, we like, um, we glamped together in my, in my <laughs> upstate He's underselling construction it. His... side of a home right now, but, um, but with paper all, all along the walls, just like writing down our ideas, charting our possible narratives and, and transcribing interviews. So we're sort of in the thick of, um, of, of that formless hunch. And our, our hope is that we start at Penn State in January, and um, I'm guessing there will be modular pieces that communities can insert into the narrative. So we're exploring, like, whereas, you know, Laramie Project is the l one final word on what happened in Laramie, Wyoming, we're going to be talking about this, this gun violence epidemic for a long time. And so there are men, there's a plurality of narratives and we wanna create a structure both online and in communities where we're not going into a community co-opting their stories and writing a play, that we're writing versions of this play in kind of a rolling premiere. So we start there and we have another commitment at Western Washington. I love partnering in the universities and letting and then finding community partners. To me that feels like um, I get to make some beautiful art with some uh, places that have some resources and a vested interest in um, bettering their communities. And uh, I get to learn about my piece as I do that. Can I say something quickly about form? Um, one of the companies that I mentioned, the Young Fugitives, actually one of them walked in, I was so excited. Um, and um, one, of, one of the um, things that came up as they were making their piece, Track 13, was like not wanting to replicate a stand and talk about um, violence in their lives, which is so often what happens in youth theater. And so this like very radical commitment to thinking about um, kind of mime and physicality and alternate ways of telling a story. Um, so I, I always am so excited when people are taking subjects, particularly around the violence that young people are subjected to and thinking about like, what's the way to tell this story that um, doesn't ask them to be kind of like, reduced to the story of the violence in their life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, I want to say that like, I, there are two groups of people who are so empowered by what you, you do, not just in your artistic practice, but in your writing, which is one, 
uh, as I work with students around the country, I learn how important it is that people write about work in cities and share and disseminate and be as transparent and open as possible, um, how transformative that is. And then also artists, uh, I, I can't imagine any artist who wouldn't love for their work to be documented and remembered. And sometimes that's, that's someone like you who has a company and writes about yours and others and others. And sometimes it's you taking the agency to say, we have to tell this story because no one else is right now. So thank you, and thank you all for being here. Um, let's give them one more round of applause. Um, now what we're gonna do uh, is we'll bring up the lights, and I'm, I'm asking that everyone help make a big giant circle of chairs. If you are one of the invited panelists, uh, that just means I want you to be sitting somewhere on this side of the room. Um, but everybody should have equal uh, view of the room and of each other. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, if you don't have a notepad or just something to write on, grab one. If you don't have a pen, those should be coming around. Does everyone have a piece of paper and a pen? There's no test. This is just in case you hear something and you go, oh, that's good, and you want to write it down. Now you have a paper instead of your phone. Uh, pens right here. Um, so this is a bit of an experiment. Uh, if, for those of you who have been with us today, I apologize, but I'm going to recap what we've done. Uh, we started with a great, uh, super um, 
uh, electrifying and, and expanding uh, un, uh, workshop on the uh, the contracts that the Dramatist Guild has pulled together, the contract templates around devised theater, specifically partnership agreements and production production agreements? Yeah, or production agreement, rather. Um, and then we moved into uh, the book talks that we just had um, uh, and with, um, with Tectonic and with Koya Pass, uh, sorry, with Barb and Jimmy. Um, and so now what we're trying to do is arrive at not a solid or, or, a, or a singular definition of device. We don't want to collapse things, but really the reason why I wanted to bring this together, and I'm so thankful that everyone's here, is because devised is often a word that we toss aside uh, as, as maybe an obligation, something that was placed on the field, whether it's something we inherited from the UK or something that funders give us or something that people who run initiatives at the public theater insist that we be called. Um, but it, it has some functional purpose. And if nothing else, I think the more conscious we are about our vocabulary, the more um, critical we can be about the way we make work, about how we engage partners, how we engage audiences, and how we talk about our work. So uh, I've invited some folks here today, uh, all of whom I've asked to share a two-sentence definition or thereabouts of devised. Uh, we're gonna go around with all of them. Uh, when that's done, if anyone here else feels like I really have to share my two sentences that I've just come up with, absolutely. Uh, if you hear anything that sounds particularly right to you or particularly wrong to you or anything, if it resonates in some way, jot it down because the second half of this, and we're going to clip a pace, is I'm going to bring up a Word document here um, and then I'm just going to follow your lead. If anything was said that you think is particularly important to hold on to, I will type it into the Word document. If you disagree, I will delete it. And we will keep working through until we start to arrive at some productive language for what does devised mean. Um, that's it. Uh, what, I've, uh, what I imagine will be the focus is not just what does it mean in a mechanical sense, but, but why? What's at stake? Because if we don't have stakes for defining this word, then y'all just came here for no reason. Um, but you didn't. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start. I'm looking for a chair. Is someone you, sitting here? Chair. Oh, can I? Thank yes, you. No, no. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to read my sentences, and then I'll just turn to the other participants, and anyone can go in any order. Um, uh, I ask that we not do questions right now. Uh, oh, it's not on here. Excuse me. I, after I told you everything about phones, I have to go get my phone. Um, what's up? Okay. Um, I just asked uh, no questions or cross talking at the beginning. Let's just get these definitions out and then we'll have plenty of time to go for clarity later. All right. Stand by, everyone. I love having all of your attention right now <laughs> as my phone doesn't open. Um, oh, and when it comes around to you, um, please give a brief, 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 brief introduction of who you are. Uh, just so people understand what's at stake for you. So, Andrew Kircher, director of the Device Theater Initiative at the Public Theater, um, and also a, a, a teacher and scholar in this field. Um, Device does not point to a specific genre, aesthetic, or methodology. It is a critical category, and while many consider Device Theater to be antithetical to the dominant playwrights theater, I offer that it is actually antithetical to the hyper-professionalization of the American theater. Devised for me represents a radical dramaturgy, a means of continually remaking the theater and its professional structures to reflect a more expansive and inclusive population of creators and audiences. That's my sentences. Well, <laughs> all right. I've, oh, you should have seen how many M dashes I had. But also, Alyssa Simmons, no cross talking. Okay, uh, so thank you, Alyssa. Will you please read yours? Uh, sure. Uh, my name is my name is Alyssa Simmons. I am an assistant general manager at the Public Theater. Uh, and producer of Prelude. Oh yeah, and I produced Prelude uh, 2018. Yay. Um, so my sentences are, devised speaks to that which is created and equally owned by the participants, or 
that which is inextricably linked to the process and the individuals involved in its genesis. Great. Someone else? Jen. Hi, I'm Janani Balasubramanian. I am a fellow at the Public Theater. Um, I said, in traditional theater, we make a play. In devised theater, we make and play. Hi, I'm Natalie Gosnell. Um, I am not from the theater. I am a professor of astrophysics at the Colorado College. I am here this week to work with Janini on um, a science art theater project that I just recently learned could be classified as devised theater. <laughs> so um, I'm new to this game. Um, my sentence is <laughs> uh, that devised theater is collaboratively creating from a point of inspiration where the creation itself is not bound by stereotypical disciplinary boundaries. Hi, uh, I'm Catherine. I'm part of Sister Sylvester. Uh, and I wrote, devised theater is collectively authored disagreement. Authorship can be by, th bo by both human and non-human agents, written in languages not limited to the verbal. And then the second sentence, uh, a way to try out other social relations for world building. Hi, I'm Jimmy. I'm a member of Tectonic Theater Project. Um, you have to read our book. No, I'm just joking. Um, I took a literal approach. I, d I chose to, de to define devising and not devised. So devising is an, uh, as an action rather than a product. Um, when the content and or narrative of a piece, including text if ap applicable, is generated alongside simultaneously with staging. In Hey, uh, I'm Dan Rothenberg, co-artistic director of Pig Iron in Philadelphia. Divides Theater describes performance works made by a process in which much of the script emerges from encounters in the rehearsal room. Divides Theater often generates performance works that are not intended to be restaged by other groups. So the very notion of script expands to include a range of decisions which are not typically associated with playwriting. Hi, I'm Aya Ogawa. I'm a playwright, director, and translator. Devised theater upends the conventional creative process and performance in which the playwright and play script is at the center and the director interprets and actors embody the script. It potentially allows for a more collaborative process that disrupts the traditional power hierarchy and gives the performers, designers, or ensemble more agency in process and ownership over product. Hi, my name is Aisha Jordan, and I'm a performer and creator, creative, both. Um, my definition, uh, the creation of a work or material uh, developed using text, sound, music, movement, improvisation, or other various inspirations, um, often happening individually or through collaborations between two or more entities. Hi, I'm Ryan J. Haddad, actor, writer, solo performer in the Public Theater's Emerging Writers Group. And I wrote, the device theater is performance that is not generated on paper, but rather arrived at in real time and space in collaboration between artists or artist and audience. It is only committed to paper, this is very personal, it is only committed to paper once it is necessary to replicate the event. Um, my name is Modesto Flaco Jimenez, I make stuff. Uh, a group of individuals coming together to create a piece of work from nothing or a piece of source material you wanna fuck up with no hierarchy owned by all. Hi, I'm Maximilian. Um, I came to Devise Theater from reading um, Studs Terkel's interviews, and um, I'm basically trying to fill in the gaps um, with you know historical material by interviewing people who lived through certain events to find the parallels with what's going on today. Hi, I'm Elisa Metlovsky. I'm a theater maker, and I had absolutely no idea I was going to have to say anything. You don't have so to. I am going to pass the microphone this way. <laughs> you don't have to. Thank you. Um, I'm going to check. Oh, yes, Deborah. Um, and some of you 
may have already heard my definition, but it, the process, oh, I am Deborah Murad, so I'm the Director of Business Affairs at the Dramatist Guild. Um, the process of working collaboratively and through non-traditional means with a group of individuals, some of whom may or not, may not be writers, with the goal of creating a new work. Great. You can pass it to Sandy. Hi, I'm uh, Sandy Garner. I'm a New York-based independent producer working with artists and groups of artists on work. Um, I, de I defined the de devised theater, um, and I said, is a process during which a group of creative collaborators work together responsively and in an iterative way over time to generate material that they then shape into a live performance piece. Uh, my name is Sam Shanwald. I'm a writer and performer. Uh, I'm also a current member of the devised theater working group at The Public. Uh, I said devised theater is a mode of time-based art making that values process in the same way that it values product. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm a freelance director and teaching artist also working with Sam right now in the devised theater working group. Uh, devised theater is a space that values the collision of our impulses, interrogations, and obsessions. A process full of constant and collective Generating, generating of material followed by a simmering down to reach the material that stays alive and hot within repetition. I'm Sol de la Ciudad and I'm a divisor. Um, devising starts from a place not tethered by civility but rather motions that seek to not preserve a need for an ending. Devise is an abundance, not a means or logic of scarcity because it requires us to disposition humanism in tune into listening, not as an object, but as a mode or field of study. You can pass to Goya. <clears throat> it's a way of creating theater that welcomes the ideas and contributions of everyone in the room that relies on collective vision rather than the singular vision of a playwright or director. It happens in the spaces between people. It responds to the space. It responds to the world outside of the space because the people in the room can't help but bring it in. Great. Be very reductive. Devised, devised is any playmaking process that does not start with a playwright alone in a room. Did anyone else? feel inspired to jot down some thoughts that they want to share? It's okay if you didn't. Anyone? Okay, great. So now um, we're going to move to the second part. I am going to sneak by you, Flaco. Um, I'm going to bring up a Word doc on here. Thanks, Mike. Um, and as I said, I, I'm just going to write what people say. So if there's something that was said where you go, that. That has to be in our definition of devised. Again, we're not leaving here and running through the streets screaming, we solved it. <laughs> we're just doing it as an exercise. Uh, yeah, that, that's space four. So yes, Koya. I loved, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. What's your name? Me? Yeah. Ryan. Ryan, I loved what Ryan said about writing it down only when you need to replicate it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Only when you need to replicate it. Great. Yeah. The thing that struck me as radical when I heard it was equally owned by the participants. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can do this. Great. Anything else that stood out? Yeah. Uh, I love what you said about listening being a field of study. Great. I'm gonna just Listening is a, okay, a field of study. That it's process-based and generative. Uh, great. <laughs> it is process-based and generative. What else? What, what, Barb, right? Barb? what Barb said about um, it's a form of play and it doesn't necessarily start with the playwright. Yeah, that, that's any. reductively what I said is it's any playmaking process that doesn't start with a playwright alone in a room. Thank you. Uh, alone actually in a process. room. Mm -hmm. Well, this, if I can, I lied, I am going to talk. Uh, <laughs> Jenny, you said something along the lines of it is a form of play. Yeah. 
What was that? Uh, I said it's not where you make, it's where you um, make, make a, a play. play versus make, make a play. play. Can I, can I just write that because I really liked it? Yeah. <laughs> can I disagree with something? Yes, please. Um, as a writer, um, I'm going to speak up for the idea that device theater actually can start with writing as a kind of devising. Mm -hmm. I just doesn't have to be written in the same way that maybe playwrights write. Um, writing can be done in a devised way. R and writing can be at the center of a devised practice. Is that what you're saying, or? I'm saying writing can be done in a devised way. Which so what would you change here? Devised is written down only when you need to replicate it. Because mm -hmm. I think you can actually start from text or work with text. Do you want like maybe only written down when you want to replicate it, but then to balance it with, but it, but, but a devised work can also begin from a text? Yeah. Okay. So before I uh, call on another hand, I want to just point out, so this right now should be treated as a placeholder, that, that we have two things that are diametrically opposed to each other, that it's only written down uh, when you have to replicate it, or it can be done with a playwright. And I think this is one of the core challenges of devised, is that we try and make space for those two things, instead of coming up with what is a third definition that doesn't require us to say it's this or this, and kind of wince when we say it. So if anyone has any of those thoughts of like, how can it be both instead of having to put a qualifier? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, someone on this side of the room mentioned that it's inextricably linked to the individuals involved. I think that speaks to what you're saying of, it's not attention necessarily, it's about the preference of what suits the theater makers involved. To the participants, yeah, Dan, you said something about that, right? <laughs> It's not, it's not yeah, made for other bodies. I thought it was dumb at the time when I said it. But <laughs> <laughs> You're never dumb, Dan. <laughs> just, just I said it's not usually intended for other people to restage. So I'm really struggling to try to explain how that works, right? I mean, how? Well, I mean, to that point, Dan, that's kind of what I was centering on, that the idea that a piece is built on the people that are in the room. And so when you, if you were to receive it, it wouldn't be the same piece, because it's different people, different bodies, different experiences. And so that's kind of what I was poking at as well, this idea that the piece itself is informed by the people who are creating it. So I feel like it prioritizes a different energy, but I just don't know how to put that in, you know? <laughs> I was, I'll put this out there as a theme that is kind of what I feel like you're talking about, that it's a process that um, prioritizes the relationship between the creators rather than the product right. or, or what it's Rather than to. the play script that you end up with. The, it's actually, it, it, it prioritizes the relationship between the creatives overall. The relationship. Or between the participants. Between I don't know the, the creatives, creatives. Oh. over. Well, and okay, so this is another point, which I'm, you're remarkably quiet for all these terms well, being thrown out. Yeah, I'm, just if we could get rid of e is equally on, it can be equally Great. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, where, did, where did I put that? It's the second paragraph, middle, middle line. Uh, it can be. I mean, I think, I think equal is a really, is a really important word. Yeah. Um, Right, there's equal in the room, there's equal in the law, there's equal in like all these different yeah. things. I think equal is important that everybody's heard and, and listening and all of that, that nobody's pushed away. And, yeah. But at the same time, he owned then, you know. Triggers a different thing. Yeah. Me. Yeah. So I want to push against two things. Going back to the writing, I think a lot of devised work has source material, whether that's writing, an interview, an article. A television show that we're adapting, you know, like I want my dreamist to do like that. I didn't know I was pregnant. Show on stage, you know the one I'm talking about. Like, but you would not end up with what you end up with if you did not bring this particular group of people together to work on that source, whether it's written or not. But I also want well, how, to sort of, I want, first. I want to capture what you just said. How can I do that? Because that well, that, it's it's that it without the particular group of people working on it, it wouldn't become what it is. 
And I do think there's something about you can't replicate it without that group of people, unlike you could have a different version of a script. I don't know that I'm helping you, Andrew. But no, I also want to. You're not, but that's okay. I want to <laughs> take. I want to say that it prioritizes relationship and process, but I'm not sure that I believe it's over the product. Again, I think we have a deep obligation to the audience, and many devisers mm -hmm. consider the audience part of their creator. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like a 500 Clown or Second City, their piece is only loosely rehearsed because it involves audience engagement. They can't yeah. even imagine what it will be until the audience is invited in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add, I don't know how to articulate this, but um, for those of us with experience devising with young people, they have a very strong relationship with school, and anything involving writing gets an extreme reaction back, which sort of stops the devising process. Okay. And what we kind of want to do is support them in being able to observe the world and their place in the world and their ability to use improvisation and to write that way without this kind of writing okay. is extremely fruitful in terms of getting them. So there is something in here when we start with the writing yeah. that starts to, for me, I have some reactions in terms of like, it's actually the taking away the pen and saying to people, you, you can use your voice without a pen, you know. And we can put it on the stage. So how it's can I capture powerful. that? I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, where you ended was, it, it, I heard two things. One was you can use your voice without a pen. And the other thing is, uh, and you'll forgive me, I think I forgot it. But it was something about like empowering people to observe the world. Yeah? Oh, something. Oh. Adobe. <laughs> oh, so oh, oh, there we yeah. go. And I'm not organizing these in any way right now. We'll get to that in a second. I'm just going to kind of dump uh, people to perceive the world. And what was the other one? It, it gives you a voice without a pen. I, 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 would, I don't like the word gives a voice because okay. people have voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it recognizes? Uh, Lens voice. Mm -hmm. Shackles. Amplifies voices with... I think there's something about being liberated from the, the oppression of writing and that writing, particularly English, has lots of rules and there's a lot of us who feel like we do it wrong and so we can't write and so we can't contribute to the theater because theater is a literary tradition. Well, okay, so when you just put something there... <laughs> the way it's taught in school, we learn it as literature. Yeah. Huh? I think in our country... Well, for white people. That yeah. is a literary tradition. Mm -hmm. But I don't think <laughs> for most of history that it was a literary tradition. Yeah, true. Right. I'm, I'm just saying the way that a lot of the young people I've worked with, the way they've been taught it, is yeah, someone gave totally. them a book. And then they go, oh, I don't, this isn't about me. Mm. So. Is it a response to a literary yes. tradition? Mm. I'm just going to write that. Uh, <laughs> and obviously we'll want to adjust it. Because what I like about what you did there is that it's not saying it's not vilifying the text or saying that the text is not the source of right. art making because the text still has a prime position, but, but that rather the literary theater, which is its own thing, mm -hmm. and, and perhaps even the sort of, if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, the sort of the, the strict frameworks of what a text can do and who has ownership or right to text is, is sort of dismantled there, right? All right. I kind of also want to push back against that idea. Uh, it's a form of play that doesn't begin with playwright alone in the room. Okay. I think that, well, for one thing, it's more useful to define devising as what it is and what it isn't. But also, like, I think that a, a devised piece can start with a structure and then, you know, be opened up to, you know, a group of creatives. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what devised theater is. It is like the opening up to like a group of people to like start or continue creating. So maybe we remove it doesn't start with the playwright alone in the room. I think it's important to remove. Kind of those big words, like play or like things that signify like it, this person. It, it's exclusive almost. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So instead, like it doesn't begin with prescribed roles. Yeah. That sounds yeah. Okay. Uh, and you made another good point, which is let's not define it uh, in the negative. Right. It's not this. It's not that. But be affirmative about what it is. Yeah. So I think that's, I put that, and the other thing I just want to note is if anyone has a definition of terms, because there's times where we're throwing out words, 
and, and we're being slippery about them, so if anyone wants yeah. to anchor that, that'd be great too. Yeah. Um, two things. One, I, I think that it doesn't have to begin with prescribed rules. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, um, it can't be replicated. I feel like some can be replicated. As a performer, I've done right. things where I've had to step into stuff. Great. And, um, so I, I think that. Where did I write that? That's top, second, okay, cool. second row to the right. All right, great. Yeah. Let's so, cut that. <laughs> I think we already sort of get that when we say it's built on, uh, built on, I don't like a built on, that sounds kind of like exploitation of labor. Around? With? With. <laughs> but I like, there's maybe another word because it's not just built with them, but that it's like, Creative. it's for those bodies. It's, it is like, I am for. For, for. <laughs> with <laughs> and for. So, all right, oh, now look, everyone's going, yeah. I guess there's a part of me that's thinking, that we have to let the material, that somehow the material tells us how to work with mm -hmm. it. So the content prescribes the method often. Yeah. If you are not wed to one way of devising. Devise another. <laughs> listen to how, you know, what does the material, how yeah. does it want to totally. come through you? Uh, I think, because there are there could be so many different relationship structures in device theater, maybe it's important. And I think that hearing everyone talk, I just realized that I've always thought the definition of device theater means that it's created by an ensemble. And now I'm changing that definition for myself. I can be a solo mm -hmm. yeah. with device. Glad I had it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's, I think it's important to kind of rectify all these like people and their roles and who they are in regards to devised theater and their, that it requires accountability from the hierarchy if it exists within the structure of devised theater. So if there is, so if there's a director, if there is a this, that, if it's devised, every, that, there needs to be accountability and showing that the work was created by a group of people, that it was yeah. devised, it was generated by people in a room, uh, however, whatever the definition is, that it's not, maybe that's the thing, it's not yeah. uh, one person, unless it is one person devising on their own. Well, but what you said that I think is really valuable is you, you signaled back to what Koya said, which is you still got to have someone, like people have functions and roles yeah. and decision making uh, uh, responsibilities. So what you said is it's not about not having a hierarchy, it's about having that accountability yes. uh, in that hierarchy. Yes. That's great. I have a question, which is, I feel like a lot of this is what we're putting on this document is for ensemble device theater. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because the I mean, like prioritizing hierarchy, prioritizing the multi-visionary product, can that happen from someone devising on their own? Mm -hmm. So I, I just I don't know. I guess my question is, what kind of device theater are we trying to define here? <laughs> <laughs> because it's Ryan. too big. To Ryan, kind of jump in. Um, yeah. Because like. Even if I'm devising a text and it's just me and the audience together and like I'm just spouting things, once I do put it on paper because I'm trying to create something I can repeat over and over, there are inevitably a direct there's a director who comes in or designers who come in and they become it's not an ensemble of like other performers with me, but it's still like a process in which the text is living and breathing and people are going. No, I don't think, or maybe you should. And so there, it's, I mean, I don't think, unless you're really, really a genius, you can put up a piece of theater truly just by yourself, ever. Right, so my question is, what makes that different than from developing a new play? Yeah. Right. For any kind of collaboration. Oh, I, can I, can I, does it have to do with improvisation? I, I just read this great article that Eric Bogosian wrote in 1991 of taking you step by step through how he creates a work. And it's a lot of these things. It's clearly a devised work, but he's the only person in the room, so it doesn't have to be an ensemble to be devised. But doesn't it have to be improvisational? It, doesn't improvisation have to play some role in the pro Can you devise a piece without improvising? Because that word's not up there anymore. Right. Mm. And I think it, it, it is in that the, the word play is up there, but I think you're right also, especially following um, uh, you bringing us back to Viola Spola, that improvisation in all aspects is, is at the core of this too. Um, uh, who does not? I want to grab someone that you haven't spoken. Right? 
Uh, I think someone said, one of the first people who spoke said it's not specific to a genre or aesthetic or type that's of me. content. Oh, you. <laughs> but I think that's what we're all like getting at is, is all about the process itself. And so I think that, I, I, the question occurred to me, if something is now created, is it no longer devised? Sure. I, I can say that like what yeah. I mean in that regard yeah. is that it is, um, that I will often say that there is no such thing as device theater. That is to say, you can't yeah. point at something and go, that's a piece of device right. theater. Yeah. It's a critical category that helps us make space for the fact that the, uh, the underlying process was devised. Yeah. An artist created a unique way of making a work. The end product might look remarkably similar to a play. Right. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. but, but that it's how the making right. is happening awesome. that does not track along normal playmaking lines. Mm -hmm. But that's my personal definition. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just to add another thing that you said along those lines, a means of continually remaking the uh, process and structures of theater. Uh, Aisha, what were you going to say? No, just the word play, because it always makes it seem like then it has to be a play, when it yeah. may not be a play. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so let's, let's get the word play out of there. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not that it has to be out of there, because there are things that become plays, but then, like, just also performance pieces or events or experience. You know what I mean? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Right now, we haven't used the word performance or event or experience at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, you're well, talking about as taking as out as play as, as a product, not play as, yeah. as yeah. play. Well, right, like, I don't think yeah. that it's always, uh, that's not always the end product. Yeah. Now, no verb, yes. Yeah. Right. And product. Yeah, we accept the verb. May be plays, <laughs> performance, events, experiences. Call it up. I said concert because concerts because <laughs> that's the goal. Also, uh, just the fact that it's process driven. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, only because I think everyone, like, yeah, but I think we all thought different things. Uh, I, what, is, what did I mean? Yeah. What did I mean? Um, that it trick, I thought of it when we were talking about hierarchy and things like that, mm -hmm. that um, what's creating the piece is the process that you're putting into it, and what results at the end is due to the process, and what's owned is due to the process. So if there are so many devices. Types of processes that define themselves, right? In the, in yeah. Great. And and what it, again? Not to speak in the negative, but then it sounds like what, as opposed to other forms of theater, where what is made is not conscious of its process, mm -hmm. because the process yeah. is right. is part is a given. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I listening here, and, and I'm getting the feeling like I have no relationship to the word divides. Cool. So I reject uh, uh, defining it as a definition because I can't relate to it. But I think about what Peter Brooks said when someone said to him about a stage, and he said, this is not a stage, this is a playground. This is where we play. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, John, uh, Joseph Boyce talked about social sculpture. And I think that somewhere in the playground of a social sculpture, I can feel more comfortable in what we're sure. sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, this isn't necessarily something to put up there, but something I, I feel like we're, I, I hear and I want to explore, that maybe the vice theater is uh, a response to thinking of theater as something that can be owned um, properly. Or so fixed. right, um, the device theater is attempting to focus on experience instead of um, property. I know this is not true, but I just wrote that. <laughs> I just <laughs> like, did you show up at three thirty? <laughs> yeah, right. I understand. I understand that that's like it, we have like we're, we have to work because nine times. No, but work. ideologically, perhaps is a place to start, right. and then that's why I want to talk about. Yeah. It. Um, well, this is bumping up against, I just want to like, uh, yes, let's keep this going, but I want to point out something that we're bumping up against, which is, um, so what? Because um, I, I, you know, I get up every day and I go to work and I, I dedicate my life and, I'm, and I make huge sacrifices in my life to work on something called device theater and it sure as shit can't be because I think they make pretty plays. Do you know what I mean? And so, 
So why? <laughs> because if we don't get to the so what, we will labor on what does it look like. And what it looks like seems to be incidental. I have some opinions about why, but I don't know if you want them for the definition. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I, sh I feel like it should be in the definition. Okay. We don't. I think it's intrinsically related to capitalism. Great. Um, and I, I think a lot of the device methods that we've arrived at in a contemporary sense have been because um, we're rejecting, hopefully, uh, a relationship to something we were all born into in this country, which is a system that profits in really horrible ways off of really strict working systems um, that disempower people who are doing uh, a lot of work and it, that can't be valued in, uh, in currency, maybe. Um, and I think capitalism has uh, made its mark in the American theater system in really unfortunate ways. And, and I, I hope that people who are participating in device theater have a, an opinion about why that devising method maybe um, disassembles. Yeah that economic model that we inevitably live in. Great, I put up, and this is not your, I was trying to bring together the devised methods or a rejection of theater's relationship to capitalism and the exploitation of creative labor. Cool, wow. that's okay. very angry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, liked uh, just some of the words, your, the radical dramaturgies I think is important. Um, I like the word collective that would use, I think what you also said, uh, to think of it as a collective. And then uh, perhaps to say that usually created by a collective with the intent, to get back to your word, um, to create a live performance. I think that's also very important, to say that the intent is to create a live performance. Well, and that's, yeah, you having the word live performance, that is the first time that's coming yeah. up. Yeah, and yeah. the radical dramaturgy, yeah, I think we should. Oh, we think. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. So when I think about the why, so much of what I, so many of the artists that I talk to reject the gatekeepers um, because those gates were put to keep them out. You know, like why wait for someone to write a play that is about the kind of person you are? Mm -hmm. Like why wait for an institution to put on the play that approximates the person that you mm -hmm. are when we can make work that is specific to the people we are and the communities we live in mm -hmm. together? That approxim I love that word, approximates who you are. Wow. That, see, yeah, yes, cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I want to speak to how much I learned from astrophysicists about what device theater is. I think I also want you to do <laughs> <laughs> One thing is that I think astrophysics and um, device theater, which is a word I didn't really understand as I was working in it, um, both are about expanding our knowable universe and intimating what our unknowable universe might be. Mm. Um, and I love that um, both these fields kind of teeter on the edge of human comprehension and um, human like collective understanding and the edge of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, making work that is devised, or whatever you want to call it, is <coughs> really, yes, <laughs> devised, is really similar to how I, I really take seriously like the process of kind of stellar formation as a kind of devising process where things are accreted from the context in which they're in. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those things bear fruits and manifest in certain ways. Those things, things are accreted from. How do you spell accreted? A C C R E T E D. What does that mean? Yeah, and to me, that's such a different metaphor from the extractive process that um, can otherwise be such a deep part. Mm -hmm. Extractive process, yeah. Uh, yeah, please. Um, this is just a comment. I don't know if anybody's been like reading along as we're like going down, but I've been noticing, like at first there were so many contradictions with like what devised was in terms of like you know is it you know can solo creation be devised? Uh, is it ensemble based? You know, does it begin with a single person? You know, all that. And with that last statement that Sam made about like you know rejecting institution, it seems like the only things in this document right now that are you know, solid and seem like, you know, singular 
and agreed upon are uh, device theater's relationship to the world outside of itself rather than the world that's happening. Oh, in yeah. So we're sort of like trying to protect device theater by giving it some sort of protected definition. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm putting that right now just so we don't forget that that's you caught something there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I boiled it down for myself as uh, any live performance generated through collective practice. <laughs> any live performance generated. Live. I boiled it down for myself too. I'm closer. <laughs> through collective practice, and what was yours? Devise theater is what happens when you apply methods of content creation to the performance arts. When you apply methods of what? Content creation. What's that? Creating content. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, I'm with you, but so like when you apply methods of content creation, like, this is me trying not to use the word devise in the sentence. In the gotcha. So, <coughs> I mean, I'm saying, like, that's kind of, I'm trying to be as, for lack of a better word, bland as possible sure. so that I can try to encompass, encompass everything. But so with this, you're saying sense? when we then, apply the methods of content creation, like, think about how we make. To perform, you said, yeah, to, to the performance to, artist's art. Mm -hmm. To the performance. Or a performance. But couldn't that include arts. typing a script in a on a computer like a playwright does? Content creation? Are they generating content? It, it's what happens when you apply methods of content creation to a performance. Uh, so like, yeah, so a playwright, oh, um, multiple, multiple methods, not just one method. <laughs> apply multiple methods of gotcha. content creation. And it sounds like along those lines you're talking about yeah. the idea of aestheticizing practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like how do we get how we make on the stage, which is both a good and bad hallmark of device theater. Like if I get invited to a university device theater piece, I know I'm going to see their craft on stage um, for now. Um, I think we're actually getting there now with the conversation going, but circle back and maybe Ryan can respond to this afterwards. Yeah. Um, talking about like sort of the definition of solo uh, device, but even when you were describing your process, it sounds like the um, the actor of the sounding board is really important that like, can we devise something on your own if you're sitting and, and you're doing devise work if you're improvising and you write a play all by yourself what's the difference between that and just the writing process um, and is like is there another person or persons that's necessary for devise theater to work even if you're just bouncing it off the audience they're still participating uh. You were the one who you, you were the one who I talked to me yeah. about like is it a play or not? Why what's the difference between traditional playwriting? The difference is in um, the work that I create. I don't like to be bound by the traditional definitions of what a play is, mm -hmm. and so I don't uh, I don't um, uh, that that's why I I struggle with. That, um, and I don't. I think that's all. Ryan, can I add something that I know to be true of your work, which is that I think in in what we'll regard as I don't want to call it traditional theater, but let's say the literary theater, there is an assumption that, and not just legally but sort of practically speaking, that the play script constitutes a work of art. Yeah. That it stands on its own, it can be generated as that, and it's not just the impetus for a creation of a performance. It is a work of art. And, and Ryan, your work only exists in your body, in your creation, and for that moment that you want it to exist. Yeah. And there is no play script that goes and stands on its own. Although, I know, you're changing that. <laughs> <laughs> this is an older definition that I had was that in device, part of what led me to that term device theater was, was arguing about copyright. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point saying, well, you know, these are the people who are the authors with copyrightable stuff, and the other people are the interpreters. Yeah. And I said, well, wait, 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 in our world, all of the artists in the room are generators. Nobody's an interpreter. So that's, that's part of, so therefore, each of those pieces makes up part of what that complete work of art is that people are offering. They're not just lighting the people moving on stage. 
who are doing the interpreting the real work of art, which is the place where. Uh huh. And, I, and I'd recommend that you check out the drama skills. They they wrestled in those contract templates with how do you give how do you name the different types of authorship at play, yeah. um, and the different types of collaboration, which may or may not be regarded as authorship, but are still collabor collaborators in the creation of the work. So, yeah. I think I've cracked it for myself. So I was sitting here and I was like thinking about that idea of like solo devising and listening to uh, him talk to you about like your personal work. It's kind of like the Holy Trinity in a way, like where a single person wears the hat of, you know, playwright and of choreographer and, um, you know, like lighting design, yada yada, all that. And it's still collaboration, which, I mean, we've kind of sort of like made the essence of devising in this document because you're, you're collaborating with yourself in various hats. Mm -hmm. so, so we still have the sort of collaborative art, it's just Ryan collapsed it yeah. all into this. And Ryan in different times. Yes. Different I don't choreograph. <laughs> 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 well, but we haven't heard from you in a bit. Well, I'm just listening to it because I, um, I just did a piece that had me like rethink this whole shit. So um, yeah. that's why I'm like, I just need to listen today and cool. uh, talk about it. Kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, cool. The practices of the team, I, I, like as an actor, I've never got told, um, nah, bro, you, you could, your writing time is here in this room. The hours that we're paying you is for in this room. Hmm. So you don't need to write at home. So it's not even a going home for you to write these poems or if you come up with three lines during that one hour, I guess that's what you did during that one hour. Yeah. And as like a person that had to deal with all those hats, to like for that moment and be in a room that then my writing is being credited, my performance is getting credited, my body's being taken care of, so many layers of all of this. Right, but then ownership still being on me, it was beautiful, and I'm still trying to figure out what all that shit is. Where so was this fantastic work. experience? Uh, Oxford building. Oh, uh, but Oxford space. other spaces. I just show up, do my shit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know spaces. Uh, I don't like giving spaces weight like that, so I just show up to the address. I don't yeah. like giving spaces <laughs> like that. Um, so yeah, so I'm in that headspace right now that I walked into a room, I created a piece about education and theater and being the artist walking into a classroom and then just talking about the DOE and having those two worlds clash and all be devised and I came in as the piece was already just a solo performer mm -hmm. and they were like, hey, you do this. Uh, you want to come and see this and read it and let's play in the room and all of that play then it's a two person show now and all these things got created that just got put in it got respected all the credits all the money all the everything that is was mm -hmm. checked yeah but i still don't have all the language for it yeah i put uh, just this is not everything you said but it's an erasure of roles not labor because what i love is that you were saying like my, my work was recognized, and the, and the multiplicity of my work was recognized, like every level. but I also was not asked to make in this way. Yeah, so it was like, go home and memorize this and do this and do that, like everything was in the room. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Sure, I think one important distinction, whether it's a solo work or ensemble, is about the agency and the activism of the piece. Mm -hmm. And then going back to the um, thing about the device being existing in the body of the creator. Um, the fact that like um, if you're using the actual participants, you know, who are the people you, you might have interviewed, who are the real living embodiments of the work, or like even in the tectonic model, you know, if other people are acting as if they're the protagonists or whatever, um, like one of the questions is like, how would you, that you ask the participants is like, how would you see yourself on the stage? Mm -hmm. So that aspect of blurring, you know, the fictitious with the reality. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that. Well, there is. Yeah. Yeah, there is a sort of. There's a realness. There's a presence. Yeah. Because it sounds like, in most cases, we're not talking about a a, a purely representational theater. Right. There, there is. I don't know. I'm saying this to see if whether people agree. 
but the, the bodies is the body is still present. The the artist is still present. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry I said that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give her any more credit. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so the what were we saying though? The like the the realness, the the presence. The presence of who? Um. I mean, it depends. I would say, I would say, uh, the artist, but but in some, like six hundred Highlands work, I think their work is all about mm -hmm. the presence of everybody yeah. and the recognition of everybody. Mm -hmm. Where whereas I don't know if I would put that on the vice theater in general. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just mean everybody in the room. Like everybody is seen. Maybe. Um, I want to do a little bit of pruning. I, well, I'll definitely still get to people, but I want to do some pruning now. So I'm just going to read. Mm -hmm. And let's be ruthless. Let's not care about feelings. Let's also not worry if we delete something. We're doing nothing with this definition. So it's okay. Um, we're doing everything. We're going on the streets. Um, so if I read something that doesn't feel right, just say it. Let's cut it. Let's simplify. Uh, all right. Devised is inextricably linked to the participants. No. Just cut it entirely, or is there anything you would change? Um, I mean, I guess it just depends on if by participants we mean the people who created it or the people who participate in it. So do, would you modify to say the creators? The creator. No, I would actually make it not the creator. Oh, necessary. Oh, because in your mind it's the creators and the public. Yeah. Okay, so then could we keep participants and then it's open to interpretation? Sure. All right. Yeah. Uh, it is not usually intended for others to restage. Yeah? No? Maybe so? Maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe, yeah. like, what if your archive, it's an art, like the performance exists in an archive, like somebody did it and then you show it again, like people do that all the time. But is that the intention or is that, in that yeah. case, it's an archive, so you're already stepping outside of the intention to re-perform it for some new purpose, right? Maybe? Anyway, I'm, so, I'm not trying to cut you off, I'm saying, like, what, can you think of other reasons? Well, I'm saying, I don't know if it's not usually, I'm saying, I guess that's the it just seems very personal. Yeah. Like, okay. Uh, can we just cut it? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not it's a statement. It's a personal choice. It's and, not specific. Yeah. Yeah. But you can say if it's restaged verbatim that it's not an original production, but it's still a device piece of theater. Right? Yeah. Although I yeah. think that that could be true for a lot of works. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. This right. is hard. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> it's built with and for the people in the room. Uh, I don't think the for the people in the room. No. With, but yes, with, yeah, not for. Oh, oh I, that was that was my sloppiness. I was thinking like <laughs> for like did for, you mean for them to perform. Did you mean built right. and by? Built with <laughs> and, <laughs> and by. So okay, it's, it's built so with the, the people in the room. <laughs> it is a, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why? So, what? No, Mike. Sometimes. I'm just saying, like, what, what if, you know, because what if there is someone that wrote part, you know, playwright, and that isn't in the room during the process? If we're getting, like, real nitpicky here, okay. you know? It's built with people. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? Why that so good? It's built. It's built. To that end, it's built. <laughs> All right. Wait, Andrew. I have a question because it feels like. What is the role of the audience in devised performance? That too has to be devised. <laughs> it depends. So right. that, that's also <laughs> I think Sarah, I think what I feel here in the group is that there are some that consider the audience as part of the participants, and some that say the, already, the audience is distinct from right. those that are. Well, which I think we can say of theater as a whole. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. I think there might be something problematic with the way we're going about it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Because I think that, uh, so right at the beginning we decided that we weren't going to say against things. Uh, and I think that might be where we're, like maybe that's actually a really helpful thing. Maybe opposition, now that an oppositional energy is more useful than trying to come Speaking up with some kind of summation for all of these different things that come under cool. the umbrella we're trying to use. Okay, so, so then like, are there any things that you would want to? I don't know, I just, I just like to open up the possibility to be against things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, I, I, I agree. So let's, we, we can say things that are against. All right, uh, I'm going to keep going, but if there are things that we want to establish as clear, like I said in my own, that it is it is antithetical to the hyper-professionalized theater, so I totally agree with you. That, like, someone at the beginning said that against scarcity. 
Ooh. That was a really nice. Mm-hmm. So like, so, like it's the, yeah. You said abundance. Dude. Yeah. That was me, and I was gonna say in addition to that, um, devising requires listening not as an object of study, but as a field of study, which is, you only have a, it's a listening as a field of study, but it's supposed to be not not as an object of study, but as a field of study. So, Uh, not not in the wrong place. As an object of study, but but as a field field of study study. or mode of engagement. Can you can you unpack that a little yeah. bit? So like part of part of like the problems that we're having with uh, like uh, trying to define this is that a lot of a lot of this stuff seems stagnant. You know, um, mm-hmm. the point of this is not to do that. We don't want to. You know, like we want to talk about what it does in order. Like um, I, I just don't. I don't agree with. Um, this uh these notions of solidifying something as you know like this yeah well i I, and i think field of study um you know thinking of things as a field or like consent as a field you know those when we when we when we get to that point of which you know you you get these umbrella umbrella terms of like playground things like that those certain notions you know I think that that's very that's specific but also very much so not limiting yeah can I say back what I think what yeah. I hear from that too is that uh, if uh, devising requires when I hear listening not as an object of study it means like uh, in this case perhaps it's not a study of of the of the human experience and not looking at it with that sort of critical distance but that uh, it but that listening becomes like the practice that is enacted in the creation is that what you're saying or? yeah but like you know like i kind of want to move away from this whole like people and audience or like uh oh i'm gonna devise a piece where i extract these stories from these people the, uh-huh. these people no that's just fucking violence yeah. that's violence that's not Devise it. Like, I mean, like, I mean, it, I don't think, I just wouldn't include that because it's, sh- that's, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep reading for, what, is anyone just itching to that? Like, yeah. um, I just would really love to amplify what you just said because I think when you said why, I can only think about like why I'm in the room. I can't think about the why of device theater because it's not my yeah. personal disciplinary practices, but I wrote down that, like, I think. What I, why I'm here is I feel like it's a radical reimagining of how we communicate. And I think that in order to do that, you have to listen first. Um, and so I just, that really resonated with me and cool. I really appreciate you saying that. Oh, and that's a nice sort of companion, those two mm-hmm. things. Great, I'm gonna go back to editing for a moment. If you got something, hold on to it just for a sec. All right, so it's a process that prioritizes the relationship between the creatives. Can you say good? <laughs> what did you? I heard no, but also. I was just gonna say if we're gonna leave that, but we can yeah. take that. But can we say between and among? Because it, I don't think it's always a one to one relationship. You know, it's. Uh, Would people feel better if it was between and among? Sure. No. Well, it was. It is a process that prioritizes the relationship between creators. Uh, can we replace the word prioritizes? Because I don't think that the emphasis is necessarily on the relationship. Well, I think it's. I think I think that was what I said, and I was saying prior, prioritizes relationship as opposed to product. Um, the, the relationship between the creatives versus the product, which I don't think we have in that sentence, like prioritizes yeah. the relationship. Although, as you were saying, I, I saw a head shaking. So I think that <laughs> it's one of those things that we always hold on to with devised, is maybe it's about product or process, negotiating that, but then I think other people are resisting that. So I, it out. sounds like that's about it. Yes. Yeah, I think it's the okay, live performance create created. I think you created collectively. <clears throat> Can we backtrack for a second? Yeah, of course. Does anyone else have a problem with the word creatives? Yeah. yeah. Well, we kind of right, so let's, let's not return to that word. <laughs> yeah. No, I it, it felt it felt very um, Madison <laughs> Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, live performance created collectively. 
This is like collaborative creation, which maybe is not the same thing. Um, I guess I might have a problem with the word live. I know we're talking about this specifically, like in the context yeah. of beer, but we were talking before, you know, uh, during uh, Deborah's like uh, presentation about you can devise a script, and the script isn't a live performance. It's a finished piece of art that was devised. Okay. Um, so, so I, I guess the context of how we're talking. About. So if we remove that, then all we're left <laughs> with is that it's created collectively, which. That's up for debate. That's up right. for debate too, so. Is that? All right. Is that? All right. Is that? Is that? Is that? But no, Andrew, is created collectively truly up for debate? I want to debate yeah. that. All right, let's that debate it. That seems fundamental so to what we're talking about. You collaborate with yourself. Like, I actually do agree with that notion, because you can collaborate with yourself from the past. You could understand yourself as someone's mother and someone else's sister and someone's friend. And yeah. I think those are roles that you occupy, even outside the roles that the theater It's all is not about solo plays in the big picture. It's but does that mean you embody more than one person? I feel that Some I do. people I do embody one. more than one yeah. person. I think that's not true. So, that's so I guess it depends on what you define as a collective. Yeah. And yeah. working with other people is not necessarily itself a collective process. I didn't so I say collective, I said, said collaborative. collaborative. Oh, sure. Collaborative. That's where I'm like, I, I feel like if we take, yeah. we, if we take that notion of like accepting that all the collaborators, be it one or ten, right. have like you can radically reimagine what everybody's role is going to be because you're deciding that for what this needs to be. But if we take the collaborative part out of it, what are we talking about? Yeah. yeah. Great. I, I'm, it's like a real question. If we're taking out creation and we're taking out collaborative, what is it? I think that's different from what it was Different before. than the theater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> how do people feel about this? It's saying it is a collaborative creation. Yeah. We should keep that. But yeah. all theater is a collaborative. I mean, right. how does sure. that distinguish itself from yeah. anything I, I, that's I not? I think some of our definition will <laughs> be consistent with the definition of theater and some will be inconsistent, but I think that your point is totally well taken. Uh, it empowers people to perceive the world. No. 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 All right, no okay. uh, It liberates the artist from the oppression of the literary theater. I, I like that, that idea, but I don't necessarily, it doesn't have to. It's so specific. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we still have to go on the audition next week. Cool. And I feel like we get to that later in a more broad way, so not broad way. I like agency question mark. What's that? You had agency question mark. Oh, agency question mark? Yeah. I believe that. That feels weird. It was, I'm going to ask you, Sam, to hold on to the idea of agency. We don't lose sight of the fact that device is somehow about transforming the idea of agency and creation. Cool? That's yours. Keep thinking about it, make sure it ends up in here. Thank you. All right. Um, devising requires listening, not as an object of study, but as a field of study. It's a radical reimagining of how we communicate. I feel like you have to kind of say those things together. Yeah. Great, we'll keep that for now. All right, the realness, the presence. Jesus just gave us We'll come back to that. Uh, devised methods are a rejection of theater's relationship to capitalism and the exploitation of creative labor. No. Why not always? Um, because there's some shows that are devised that make it to Broadway. Right. And that is very capitalistic. So. so do you think that, so here's what I'll throw back to you, because I, what I'm seeing is maybe would it be better if it was devising is a rejection of theater's relationship no. to capitalism? No. So that, no. well, because my, what I'm offering is that we're talking about two different things, the creation and the product. The product can be a capitalist joy. Right. <laughs> but is is the is the so action of the I think it depends on how it's made. Like is this made cooperatively in a sense that's not based on you know, because it's okay. like, okay, if you have to figure out how the fuck you're gonna get money to pay for your thing, are are, are we working as a cooperative, as a as a group, like we're all paying for shit together, or are we reliant on a certain type of funding or a certain type of system, yeah. i.e. the capitalist system to right. produce well, this so that's my question, because I mean, I would love it all to be rejected. No, but it's a, it's a good question, and what I want to call attention to with someone who's saying this, and I, the reason why I put it there was, mm -hmm. um, 
it was about theater's relationship to capitalism, not a rejection of capitalism. Right. But maybe there's another way of saying that. that I feel like there's a, yeah, I feel like maybe it needs and to be. Maybe it's a questioning of, uh, like, of what that a is. A questioning of the theater's yeah, relationship right. to I capitalism? Do, I just think there are, yeah, there are a lot of nuances. Mm -hmm. well, what about just devising a response to that are our relationship to capitalism? About money? Why capitalism? That is about money. And that are uh, on Broadway shows. Like they'll bring in, they'll buy yeah. sessions where we make something that is in the show, and it's, it's that, that's that's part of the process. It's not toward, towards right. devised as a product. Right. But it, right. So then, in that respect, it's it's a contribution to rather than a questioning of. That's why I feel we keep. The part of the reason we keep getting confused is there's these three different moments of energy. I feel mm -hmm. like there's the energy, the impulse that draws the artist together. Yep. Mm -hmm. There's the time in the room. Mm -hmm and that methodology and how that works. Mm -hmm. And then there's the presenting of there's the product, product to the product. play, yeah. to the audience, which some people call a product and some people are a little yeah. excited about, about And I guess even saying uh, that it prioritizes the creative artists uh, sounds like we don't care, sounds like the people don't care about that last moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's why as people who are like, no, I really pride myself on it being good. Yeah. <laughs> and like financial worth, solving. Worth for the worthwhile for the people who watch it. Yeah. So it feels like uh, when you when you say it prioritizes that I, I just don't know how you well, I think we cut that one. We did, but but, but, I, but I feel like it's still true. Yeah. I feel like it's another way of saying it's always collaborative is is to say it prioritizes or that I, I'm trying to find these verbs which like it springs from this impulse even though it doesn't always end up sure. in that place. Yeah, you that's that's like what the intent is. Yeah, well, it, it just seems like the intent is maybe not to have you know huge amounts of profit. You're not getting in a room to make a lot of money. Right? But, yeah, but you can. But, but like it's not it's not like the impetus, you know, like you said, like that impetus to start. What drove the people into the room? Well, I'll share the reason why I said something similar was not, this is where I'm sloppy with my language, it's not about the end result, whether you productize or not productize, it's that the way we make theater uh, in like most institutions is so drastically shaped by American capitalism and by hyper-professionalization of roles and systematizing of creation that devised represents uh, a resistance to not the idea of making money or making good work, mm -hmm. but of following those prescribed Fordist models of okay. theater making. That's, but that, uh, I didn't say that, I said that. <laughs> um, I have a real problem with that because I think it's spinning back out in the other direction now. So you have the way that like, you see ads on the subway for Fiverr or what's it called, TaskRabbit. And they use the same language that we're yeah. using here back into, so yeah. when you talk about the relationship of this kind of work, mm -hmm. which comes maybe from an oppositional place, to capitalism, you've got to be really careful because we can be very idealistic and yeah. this language ends up spinning back out into that thing that we It gets productized into. itself. Yeah. yeah, no, totally. Okay, so what do we do about this? I just don't I, I'm just going to flag, I think we've got like 10 more minutes and then we're just going to freeze it where it is. Because again, this is not about making a final definition, this was just an exercise in frustration. Um, <laughs> But I do want to honor, there's some, there's some thoughts going around, so you've been waiting patiently for a while, please. I'm just wondering if everyone's getting uh, confused about different, uh, different parts of this, if there was anything about defining the process and defining the product, or, or like what Dan was saying, that there are different, yeah, we think about stages. it in different ways, that you know this one sentence may relate to the process, but not the product, or right. if there's any use of splitting this up at all. The yeah, word and versus now. No, absolutely. And this is this is a good question of does devised is it a term that refers to the entire life of a project, or does it specifically refer to how something how artists work together? Does it specifically refer to the end product? Uh, product, sorry. Um, so I think we, we do not have time to do that. But I think that's a very good point. That breaking it into uh, figuring out uh, when are we talking about. Uh, yes. So as an observation, again, it, it seems like we're like uh, the the scientists or people in a, in a room with an elephant, and everybody has a different part of it. Yeah. Or or like a person uh, giving you an orange and trying you're trying to express it. So I look at this. What we're doing here is trying to the, the actual act 
of us being here, thinking about this and talking, is maybe devised uh, theater as a metaphor. Why? Well, no, but what I love is No, what I love though is I I I was semi-conscious about who was involved in that I I both threw a big letter out to all the people I love and also then wanted to figure out who are people who look at the elephant differently. So I think that's a super astute observation that the frustration emerges from our, our sort of confluence of perspectives. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I think if, we, if, I, if I try and zoom out, which I like to do more than zoom in, um, maybe, is that like uh, radical reimagining, and I feel like we're, we're getting in arguments partly because we get to define the value systems that are important to us mm -hmm. in the making. So devising actually allows us to create the value systems. Um, and I'm wondering if there's like a way that we can I put that I in like the definition. That a lot. Yeah. Devising because allows us to create. And I think the Catherine said something really. Systems. Your name's Catherine, right? Really early on, she said like try out other social relations of world building. Like it actually gives us the space to to reject what we want to reject or go into the unknown of the system that we don't live in. Like, so I think that that could maybe allow for more agency. space. Yeah, for an agency. <laughs> and more space for us to not get too stuck in like, in the ways that like some things yeah. are valued and others aren't because I think we're always going to disagree and that's what's so wonderful yeah. About, yeah. about this. Um, oh, um, this process kind of reminds me what the of what the term queer went through maybe like a decade, decade and a half ago um, and in like a number of different cities, circles, what have you, um, in that we, people kept trying to turn a definition of this thing that was actually about being an in intangible, undefinable thing. Um, and a certain number of corporations and corporate interests and like other kinds of powerful interests have since co-opted it. Mm -hmm. And there's still a space for like queer radical imagination. And I wonder if that's something that we're experiencing now and into the future of like, yeah, device is going to be co-opted and taken up by powerful interests. Mm -hmm. And oh, yes. there's still, yeah, mm -hmm. and there is still going to be a space for um, radical imagination and uh, creation. Yeah, for the realness and presence within. For the realness and presence within us all. <laughs> um, I would, I would cut that devising is a questioning of theater's relationship to capitalism and an exploitation of creative labor because, like, all while, like, oh, I, I think that like this, this is very American centered that you all are like projecting upon this, like, what this is. I, I, I think that it's. I mean, I've, I, I just don't, I don't think that, I mean, I have opinions about what I think that sh like theater should do and what theater is doing in the world and, what, and how it is operating. And like, while like I think like it's important to, to question the relationship to capitalism, there's a lot of devices who fail to do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that uh, what's really important, one thing that I find really important is that um, it allows, it allows, it gives us, it gives us the potential to reject the gatekeepers, the institutions, because sure. it does not wait for the work to be made that approximate, for the work to be made that approximates who you are. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tidy this up in a second. I'm gonna go ahead and, like I said, this is an impossible task. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop us here. Um, I I am so thankful because look, one, I love the conversation that emerges. This is this is an experiment I've tried before uh, with authorship uh, and trying to unpack that question. What does that term mean uh, historically and, and, and in a contemporary sense? Um, and I have a lot of dogs in this fight because, like I said, I get up every morning and I come to the theater and, and I got to justify that. And um, so the full trajectory of today was so invigorating for me and I'm so thankful for everyone who came and participated in this. 
and kept opening up that question. Because for me, and I'll just share my own agenda, because I have a mic, so I get to say the last word, um, is that um, I work in the, the best, in the theater that offers the best example of what American producing can look like. Hmm. It, is, it, is, it is majestic in how it can execute theater in the way that the American theater has decided theater is made, right? And yet, what I love is that I have been given space, and, and others with me, I'm not alone in this, to actively not interrogate that, but to, um, but to ask to what extent is this machine uh, simply uh, or, or, uh, infected by the biases of the people who created this machine? And how can the inequities and the gatekeeper problems, how can, how can so much of what we uh, ascribe to a problem of curation and artistic direction be, yes, that, but also reflective of a much deeper problem, that the way we budget, the way we contract, the way that we staff, the way that we, uh, who we put in the lobbies, the way that we advertise shows, all of this is reflective of a, 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 such a deep inherent bias that we will never change our field. And so the reason why I get joyous about my job is I get to get up and work with artists or bring together a brain trust like this, and I'm actively going to steal this and take this thinking so that I can keep thinking about how our theater um, can participate in that transformation and, and can um, move away from the systems that constantly replicate themselves. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry to pull us away from this now. We're gonna have some wine, right? <laughs> And we're going to keep talking here. Um, so cheers to you all. Have a great uh,
of event is gonna like spark the entire train conversation. Oh, you're gonna be like talking. And also you're gonna tell, tell the next 40 people you're like, you need to hear about this conversation for Arn and Paul. I'm sleeping with Or at least maybe that's just me. <laughs> no, I do. I think it's I think it's so much
You did not sell it. One of the actors mentioned Believe it or not, I have 